you are. Keep the change. Oh, ta governor. Oh, Arthur. It's always nice to come home after a holiday and get back to your own little house. Here you are, Mavis. Just look at our doorstep. Oh! Oh, I forgot to cancel the milk. 28 pints, you stupid. Oh. All right. All right. Come on, then. Open the door. I can't get it open. There. Oh, oh, and you forgot to cancel the papers. Oh, sorry, dear. Oh, never mind. We're home. Oh, look. Everything looks just the same. Mavis. Come over here to the French windows. What is it, Arthur? Let me just look at the back garden. Now, that was an excerpt from Our Wilderness. <laughs> Arthur and Arthur here is a play to remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Austin Filchhaven, Captain Uriah Nantucket, MC, Theodore Fiddle, DD, <laughs> the House of Lords Formation Dancing Team, <laughs> Miss Gladys Mephistopheles. She's a devil, that one. <laughs> to continue, Exley Fangholm, His Excellency Alf Midge, and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that has personally made me about 10,000. Enemies, that is. <laughs> Mind you, I did get a very charming letter from a family in Budley Sonsetton who wrote... Dear Kenneth Horn, we heard your last broadcast, but unfortunately, when we looked in the Radio Times, we realized it wasn't. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the things that have happened since last week. On Tuesday, well, I went into my local electrician to complain. I said to him, look here, you promised to come round yesterday to mend my doorbell, and what happened? And he said, well, I did come round. I rang twice but got no reply. <laughs> On Thursday, well, I had a few items of dirty clothing that needed washing in a hurry, so I took them down to the local laundrette. <laughs> Ah, now, here we are. Now, we'll uh, pop the clothes in. There we go. Pour in the soap powder. And now, shut the lid. Now then, uh, where does it switch on? Uh, can I be of some assistance? Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. There. Nothing I don't know about this lark. <laughs> It's your first time? Yes, it is. Oh. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been coming here for years. That's all my stuff in the next machine. The old woman won't do it, you know, lazy old crane. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'll tell you some things about her. Really? Yes. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't believe in washing me dirty linen in public, though. <laughs> The only thing is, though, I met the missus in the laundrette. We shared the same washing machine together for many weeks. Oh, how very romantic. Oh, yes, very, yes. Her jumpers and my pullovers were going around before we were. <laughs> well, tell me, how, uh, how long is this going to take? Oh, what? Oh, about 20 minutes. Mine will be another half hour. I like them well done, you see. <laughs> Here, what time is it now? Just coming up to 11 o'clock. Oh, good. It's nearly time for laundrette's choice. Well, what do, you, what do you mean? Oh, it's all part of the service, a uh, request programme that goes out to all the laundrettes. It's, it's coming on now. You listen. Good morning to laundrettes everywhere. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> and today my song goes out to Mr Herbert Potkins, Machine 7, the laundrette, Chalfont St Giles. Happy washing, Mr Potkins. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. Ask for anything, don't want anything, don't want anything more. 
as usual, jolly nice pants. Here, you, you in the bowler hat. Who, me? Yes, get out of the way, you're blocking my view. That's better. Oh, look, 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 quick, quick. No, too late, you missed it. My shirt had its arm round Mrs. Burton's blouse. <laughs> Mrs. Burton? Yes, our next door neighbour. Always puts a few things of hers in each week. There, see, just coming round. Those are hers. <laughs> Did you see the pink lace round the edges? Oh, yes, what pretty pillow slips they are. <laughs> well, I think I'll read the paper. Oh, you don't know what you're missing by not gazing into that little glass porthole. <laughs> it's a veritable underwater paradise with multicoloured clothes dripping through the deep tadded water. Better than the television. Yes, but then what isn't? <laughs> That's what I say. You can safely look in without fear of ever seeing a Western. Yes, a Western. Now, I must admit there are rather a lot of them, aren't there? I'll say. My television at home's got bow-legged. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what gets me down more than anything. It's, they're all American. Why don't they ever have one with an English hero? Yes, yes, that's not a bad idea. I could see myself as the hero of an epic like that. Now, let's think. It would start... Tumbridge Wells, Fargo. <laughs> Tumbridge Wells, 1899. A uh, lawless town, hired out for desperados and gunmen. A town ruled by those who were quick on the draw. A town where the streets weren't safe to walk on. A town of gambling saloons, bad liquor and bad women. A town... Oh, get on with it! <laughs> yes, this was Tunbridge Wells. Hey, you. You talking to me? Yeah. What's two and two? Four. You know too much. <laughs> that kind of thing happened every hour. And outside the Wells Fargo office. Here comes the stage. It's three hours overdue. <laughs> What's up, Cassidy? Uh, the stage was held up by bandits. Uh, they got the gold shipment we was bringing from East Grinstead. <laughs> That's the third this week. So what was you doing? Uh, we did all we could. Uh, we was outnumbered. We couldn't help it. I don't wish to know that. Kindly leave the stage. <laughs> Darling, why is it everyone gets away with everything in this here town? We got a sheriff? Hey, sheriff! Where are we gonna have some law and order around here? I'm doing the best I can, boys. I'm out rounding up my posse now. Here, posse, posse, posse. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, it's about time someone cleaned up this here town. Yes, this was Tunbridge Wells, and then one morning, a stranger rode into town. Tall in the saddle, kind of cool and remote, ten-gallon hat and carnation in his coat. In rode the stranger to glory and fame, and Bronco, Bronco, Trump Spanchon. Lovely weather we're having. Howdy, stranger. You're a stranger in these parts, ain't you, stranger? <laughs> well, yes. As a matter of fact, I've been three weeks in the saddle. Then you must be rawhide. <laughs> no, my name's Trubbs Fanshaw. Trubbs Fanshaw? Yes. I got it. 
You're a Wells Fargo man. That's right. I'm from head office. Will you come do something about the stage hold up? Well, yes, yeah, so that and a spot of golf, of course. Now, tell me, where can I find the sheriff? Ah, uh, Miss Kitty. Oh, she be down the road a piece. You can't miss her office. You'll see all the posters outside of the wanted men. What are they wanted for? Miss Kitty. <laughs> Well, good luck, stranger. Good luck. Good luck. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, are you Miss Kitty? Yeah, that's right, stranger. Kitty Dillon. But my friends call me regularly. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm Bronco Trubbs Fanshaw. How do you do? Trubbs Fanshaw, eh? Say, you're quite a big man around the frontier. Yes, I'm putting on a bit of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm putting on a bit of the back here, too, actually. <laughs> so you're the sheriff, Kitty, are you? Yep, that's right. Say, why are you looking me over like that? Well, to see how much there is in the kitty. Now, um, <laughs> tell me, isn't it a little unusual for a woman to be sheriff? Yep, yeah, I suppose so. But a Dillon has always been sheriff here, ever since my great-grandfather, Bicarbonate Dillon. <laughs> he was an early settler. <laughs> and don't you have any help? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. There's my deputy. Hey, Chichester! <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I'm a coming, Miss Kitty. <laughs> I see you got company. Yes. I say that's rather a nasty limp he's got. Yeah, uh, take no notice. There's nothing wrong with Chichester. He just wears his pants too tight. <laughs> <laughs> say, Chich. This is Bronco Chub Spencer. <laughs> I uh I hear to you, they say you're pretty fast. You and Miss Kitty should get on well together. <laughs> yeah, we can do with a man like you in Tunbridge, Wales. All right, now, what information can you give me about the stagecoach robberies? Well, uh, we've got a pretty good idea who's behind it. The same man who's responsible for every crooked thing in this here town. But he's dangerous, Mr. D uh, real dangerous. <laughs> yep, I reckon that about sums up Jake Kincaid. Jake Kincaid, eh? Now, where can I find this Jake Kincaid? Like as not, he'll be in the Diamond Garter Saloon. You know, that's just opposite the library. But be careful, mister. Uh, real careful, Mr. Fanshaw. Oh, Is this the Diamond Garter Saloon? No, this is a library. Sure. <laughs> Look here, mister. What do you want? I'm looking for Jake Kincaid. <gasps> uh, that's Jake Kincaid over there. Come on, let's get out of here. Well, there's only two of us here now. Are you Jake Kincaid? Oh, yeah, that one, are you? <laughs> Jake Kincaid, bandit, thief, crook, killer, and desperado. Oh, don't be like that. <laughs> Why do you wear a mask, Kincaid? Well, so would you if you had a face like mine. <laughs> All right, Kincaid, this is it. Draw. Oh, no, stop messing about. I said draw. Oh, right. Well, give us the pencil and paper, then. <laughs> you know what I mean. Go for your gun. I don't have to. I've got it with me. <laughs> then use it. I'm going to count up to three. Oh, he's educated. <laughs> One... Two, three. Oh. Ooh, 
I shot him in the saloon bar. <laughs> hey, just a minute. Something's gone wrong. Do you realize you've done something that's never been done before? You shot the hero. Oh, well, that's show business. <laughs> Well, I'm all right, really. In fact, I'm safe and sound to introduce once again the Fraser Hayes Four. Farewell to cold winter now that summer's come at last. Nothing have I gained but my true love I have lost. I'll sing and I'll be happy like the birds upon the tree. For since he deceived me, I care no more for he. For I'm going to marry. A far, far nicer boy. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week, we present a close-up on the BBC. Well, the British Broadcasting Corporation is undoubtedly. First of all... <laughs> let's have a word with one of those impeccable BBC announcers. Glad to meet you, sir. Oh, the pleasure's mine, I assure you. <laughs> And uh, what particular job do you do as an announcer? Oh, all sorts. At uh, present, I'm one weather and shipping forecast. <laughs> Fascinating. Yes. What's what's the uh, <laughs> what's the what's the latest one? Oh, oh. Uh, well, uh, south coves have been hoisted in the sea area: Shannon, Biscay, Ross, Fastnet, and Irish Sea. <laughs> and uh, winds are west to southwest for six. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what's the uh, immediate outlook? Occasional showers. <laughs> well, actually, there's been quite a lot of criticism of BBC News bulletins recently. It has been said that they're dull and uninteresting, and one suggested improvement is that we have a woman to read the news. Can you imagine what that would be like? Hello. <laughs> well, I can hardly wait to tell you some of today's news. <laughs> what do you think has happened? Lady Cynthia Fancourt is divorcing Sir Gerald. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I'm not surprised, no. <laughs> the way he's been carrying on lately, my dears. Oh, well, I'm not a one for gossip, oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. Now, what else have I got for you? Oh, yes, yes. Have you heard about Mr Lucas Gravelwick, the MP for, um, oh, somewhere or other, well, um... The poor dear's in hospital. Yes, yes, he is. He went in for an operation late last night. Same thing that I had. Oh, my dear, I shall never forget mine. Yes. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now we're very proud to meet the BBC's oldest producer. Good, good evening, New Town. Uh, very, very happy to be here. Thank good you. Night. Good night. No, no. Just... <laughs> oh, no. I didn't know. I no. thought it was... I... Well, we're, we're delighted to have you with us, Jakes. Yes. <laughs> and how long have you been with the BBC? Uh, 65 years. 65. Oh, what, a, what an incredible record of long uh, service. Incredible. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Exactly, yes. exactly how old are you? Uh, 89. 89. 89 years old. I'm still working for the BBC. <laughs> Really? Yes. Really? I, I'm, I'm producing a program every week. And what program is that? Uh, that t t teenage Club. Yeah. 
Well, now, the BBC is a vast organisation, and naturally, it's always aware of its duty in providing programmes that you, the public, will enjoy. We are privileged now to eavesdrop on a top-level meeting of programme planners to hear some of the new ideas being put forward. Another... Another important aspect of the BBC's work... is the vigilant watch kept on existing programmes. Every morning, well-informed men at Broadcasting House discuss the previous night's output. Hello, Charles. Hello, Rodney. <laughs> I say, did you hear the Greek play on the third programme last night? I thought it was brilliant. Oh, I do so concur with you, Rodney. Absolutely dolly. Oh, dolly. The <laughs> actors were magnificent. What about that hour and a half of chamber music? I know. I was really sent, but mm. sent. They, they played one of my favourite pieces, the prelude in allegro for flute, oboe, viola and bassoon. What else did you hear? Well, that programme in Russian, quite good, and that dreary talk on those Nubian antiques. Uh, <laughs> I quite agree, it was banal. The programme director is bound to ask me for my opinion, I shall just have to tell him. Oh, look, here comes the programme director now. Oh, all right, Charles, leave him to me. Good morning, sir. Morning. Fourth floor, please. Certainly, sir, going up. Stand clear of the gates, <laughs> Finally, let us consider BBC television. Among its many informative but entertaining shows, one of the most popular is the programme on wildlife in Africa. And once again, just back from safari, are Ambrose and Felicity Dennis. Good evening to you. Be quiet, Felicity. <laughs> It wasn't me, Ambrose. I think it must have been Pogo. Oh, of course, Pogo, the vicious fang-toothed Carigua. Oh, yes, indeed. What a job I had catching him. Then we also captured the deadly poisonous Makara snake. And that's him coiled round Felicity's neck. Yeah, they yeah. become really good pals. Oh, yes, <laughs> some of our other new pets are the dangerous long claw. Chahula, a crocodile and a man-eating tiger. All of which we encountered on our recent... Ah! Oh, oh, you silly old faggot. Oh! Oh! Oh, oh, what oh. is it? Oh, there, what? on the floor. Look, Ambrose, look. What, what? A mouse! Oh, 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 oh no! There you are. They'll be another Horner Armour next week when the subject will be new dentists. Do they really know the drill? <laughs> so until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Is a physicist a man who puts the bubbles in lemonade? Good night. <laughs> You might have been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. <laughs> Settle down. Settle down. Now, first this morning, we'll take Simpkins Minor. Stand up, boy. Right. Carry on. Uh, well, sir, I heard that tubby fellas has been meeting Rosemary Carter behind the tuck shop in morning break. Well done, Simpkins. Well done. Now, what about you, Barbara Hargreaves? Well, sir, I, I have it on good authority that Jane Fairgood of the Third has been missing netball practice to go swimming with Roger Beckles. Excellent. Excellent. Nine out of ten. Next. Uh, that was an excerpt from School for Scandal. <laughs> Another in our series a play to remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. 
Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Nosbert Halliburton the first, Petunia Wilt, Nosbert Halliburton the second, <laughs> Paddy Josh Llewellyn and his Spanish dancers, <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Flagg. Oh, she's up the pole. <laughs> to continue, Fingers McGee of Interpol, <laughs> Nosbert Halliburton the third, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken. Well, now, in a recent survey, nine out of ten housewives said they preferred this show to any other soap powder. <laughs> well, now, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since last week. On Monday, I got on the underground to come into town, and I sat back making plans for the day. But unfortunately, my plans went wrong. She got off at Oxford Circus. <laughs> However, I popped into the Aeolian Review Bar, had a peep and popped out again. <laughs> quite, quite ridiculous, these places. All those girls strip-teasing, and there's a cover charge. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know how the girls get away with it. They ought to be exposed. <laughs> Personally, I find the whole business nauseating, disgusting, and absolutely pointless. On Tuesday, I went there again. <laughs> And then on Wednesday, I ran into a friend of mine who has a job as a human cannonball. He's always being teased just because he gets fired out of a gun at the circus. But he believes he has a great future. After all, as he said... It's not easy to find men of my calibre. <laughs> and on Friday... Well, Friday was rather a special day. I decided to buy a new car. My old one was getting so unreliable that sometimes I used to take a girl out for a ride and we both had to walk back. <laughs> anyway, I made up my mind to have a Sprontse Mark 7. So I went along to their West End showroom. Good morning. Ah, oh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Bronzy cars at your service. Please sit down. And now, sir, I take it you're interested in these bronzy Mark 7. Yes, well, more than interested, actually. I'd like to buy one. Oh, 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 sir, you can't just walk in here and buy a car like that. Oh, dear me, no. Yes, but look here, sir. Ah, oh, sir, please, please. I've spent six long years at the Training College of Salesmanship and, what's more, passed out with honours. Does this mean nothing to you? Of course. Well, you must know something first about the model. I mean, you haven't even asked me about the suspension, and it's my best answer, too. <laughs> well, uh... Oh, go on, go on. <laughs> go on, ask me about the suspension. Oh, all right. What about the suspension? Oh, thank you. Well, sir, the suspension is the independent coil spring type with caster and camber angles of one and three degrees, respectively. Swivel pin inclination, of course. Yes, well, now, now that I know all that, uh, I'd like... Uh, I, 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 I... Uh, 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 <laughs> Uh, uh, steering, lubrication, carburetor, especially economical. It saves 50% on petrol. The sparking plugs save 40% petrol. And the hydraulic pedal-free clutch saves another 20%. I suppose if you do a long journey, the petrol tank overflows. <clears throat> You're a chameleon. <laughs> uh, I'll have that in writing, I think. Now then. <laughs> If, the, if that's everything, do you think I could order the car? Of course, sir. Oh, good. Well, now, here's the check with my address. I'll wait to hear from you. Goodbye. Good day, sir. Well, honestly, some of these customs are so difficult. Well, now, that's settled. Now, what shall I do? I think I'll just hang around here for a bit. Ah, standing on the corner, watching all the girls go by, on the corner, watching... Good heavens, this girl's Pat Lancaster! Hello. 
Hello, Ken. Was that you I heard singing? Well, just about, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather hear you sing, you know. Of course, I know it's not possible without Paul Fenelay and the Variety Orchestra, and, and they couldn't possibly be around. Oh, don't be too sure. Look who's coming down the road now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Oh, Paul, Paul, so this is what you get up to in your spare time. Oh, yes, but please don't tell the BBC. Why, uh, do you think they'd mind? Oh, yes, I'm using the Director General's cloth cap. <laughs> well, your secret is safe with me. Well, by another strange stroke of contrivance, you're all here, so sing, Pat. <laughs> Jolly nice, Pat. And thank you, Paul, too. Good luck to you. And thank you, Kim. All right, boys, after four. One, two, three, bang. Well, Pat, now then, where are you off to? I'm going to the pictures, Ken. But again, you're always going. You, you must be quite a cinema lover. No, I go to watch the film. <laughs> No, I didn't really mean that. I mean, you're a real film fan. Yes, I am, Ken. And I love those film magazine programmes on the radio. Oh, so do I. Especially that one introduced by somebody who sounds rather like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's it called? Uh... <laughs> Picture go round. more to your favourite film programme, where, as usual, we have lots to interest the movie fan. First, we have an excerpt from the soundtrack of the new British film, The Other Woman, starring Celia Mitchell and Trevor Hawkins. <laughs> it's a drama of human emotions, and this scene is where Sir Clive Debden returns home one evening from his job at the Foreign Office. Is that you, Clive? Yes, Helen, it's me. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the train was late. How did it go today? Oh, same as usual, sort of. <laughs> no, dear, no, I, I didn't mean that. I, I meant... Oh, well, never mind. Drink? Thank you, Helen. Say when. Helen... I'm afraid I shall have to go out this evening. No, but have you forgotten? Peter and Sylvia are coming over. Oh, when? Thank goodness I can stop pouring now. <laughs> Here's your drink, Clive. Thanks. Helen, can you stand a shock? Oh, Clive, you're not going to ask me to mend another fuse. <laughs> Helen, I'm, I'm afraid it's pretty serious. <laughs> Sit down, dear. We've always been honest with each other, haven't we? Of course, Clive. Except that time when I didn't tell you it was me who'd left the cap off the toothpaste. <laughs> Helen, please. This is no time for jokes. If that was a joke. <laughs> Clive, whatever is it? Helen, we are both adults. I'm sure we can be sensible about this. Work it out in some way, together. You're not trying to tell me that... Yes, Helen, I am. Oh, no. I'm afraid so. What's her name? Conchita Juanita Lolita Pepita Montez. <laughs> She's not foreign, is she? <laughs> yes, Helen, she is. Does that make it worse? Much. Clive, there's one thing I must know. Anything, Helen. Have you actually? That is, uh, I mean... And that I'm afraid we must leave the other... <laughs>
If you want to know how it all turns out, then of course you ought to see the film. Now to the new Crank Organization's second feature. <laughs> their second feature, Strange and Traditional Crafts in the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> Listen now to the title song, sung on the soundtrack by Frankie Darren. <laughs> Crafts in the Alba Hebrides, where every girl you meet is out collecting peat <laughs> and basket weaving is a many splendid thing. Oh, strange and traditional. Well, that's all we have time for, right? <laughs> now it's time for Spencer Harrington and the answers to last week's film quiz. Well, as you'll remember, we tested your knowledge of films by asking first, what famous picture did this come from? <laughs> I wonder how many of you got it right. <laughs> it was, of course, from the Barretts of Wimpole Street. <laughs> now, what about the mystery voice? A very familiar film star, but we speeded up the soundtrack and it sounded like this. <laughs> Well, this is the voice played at its normal speed. Yup. <laughs> and thank you, Spencer Harrington. Another film excerpt now, and this time it's the new French film at the Continental Film Cinema, Hackney Wick. <laughs> Starring Michel Montage and Danny Gabel. <laughs> And it's a good thing you can't see the subtitles. <laughs> Just arrived in England as American tough guy, Bart Winchester. He is talking to Peter Noble. Uh, Mr. Winchester, we, we've seen you in so many gangster roles. Aren't you just a little frightened of being typecast? Yeah, I must say that being known as a gangster in so many films has its disadvantages. People get so used to my film parts, they really think I'm like that in real life. Oh, no. Well, I'm telling you, it's true. I, I've noticed at parties, people sort of keep away from me. I, I don't know if they expect me to pull a gun or something. It could be, you know. And I mean, these crazy people are. <laughs> Most amusing. <laughs> One rather pertinent question I'd like to ask. Yeah? Well, I, I know you're rather touchy about this, but I, uh, is, it, is, uh, um, is, uh, is it true that you wear a wig? Well, what a nice chap Peter Noble was, wasn't he? <laughs> Finally, in Picture Go Round, we have something a little unusual. An unprecedented happening in the film world recently is that two film companies have made a film about the same thing. The life story of Oscar Furious. <laughs> With us in the studio are the two actors who play Oscar Furious in the rival films. Well, now, gentlemen, you're both playing exactly the same film role. What have you got to say about it? Snap. <laughs> Snap. 
so much for the silver screen. And now for the golden voices of our resident songsters, the Fraser Hayes Fall. <laughs> And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on local affairs. Is there one going on next door? <laughs> well, now, first of all, let's talk to those who work for the Borough Council. You, sir. What department do you represent? Uh, sanitation. <laughs> and uh, what does that entail? Uh, well, this section is responsible for most aspects of sanitation throughout the district. Uh, it encompasses all sorts of services, such as refuse disposal, sewage, wash houses, swimming pools, shower baths, hosing down. It's quite extensive. Yeah. <laughs> but I believe you, uh, you have a, a particular duty to perform. Uh, that is so, yes, yes, I have. I, I myself personally am used by the council for a special purpose, mostly in the summer. Well, well what for? Uh, laying the dust. <laughs> Well, now, here's a lady. Now, madam, in what branch of local service are you engaged? Shh. <laughs> oh, 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 you work in the library? Yes. I am, in fact, chief librarian. Oh, and tell us, madam, at your particular library, what is taken out most? Me. <laughs> and I hope you're returned within the week. <laughs> um, now, sometimes, of course, friction is caused in local affairs. Take the residents of a certain street in Hampstead who have protested against the council's decision to remove all the beautiful trees from their road. Standing by me now is the organiser of the protest. What have you got to say? <laughs> Lastly, let us have a word with a delightful old character... Delightful old character, the local park keeper. Good evening. Uh, good evening to you, to you, sir. Good evening thank to you. you. And thank you. Thank you and good night. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> now, sir, how long have you been looking after this park? Uh, 35 years I've been here. 35 years? 35 <laughs> years. Uh, of course, the things have changed, changed quite a bit since it's the old days, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, well, how, how uh, do you mean? Oh, uh, there used to be some fine old goings on in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 after the park gates have been closed. Oh, really? Uh, really? Oh, yes. Uh, some rare old times. Girls being chased all over the place. Yes, I'm sure. Oh, dear. Yes, sir. I mean, I, what uh, you're saying oh, is this, if you'll excuse uh, me, this uh, this sort of thing doesn't happen quite so much these days. Oh, no, no, not now. Well, why is that? Well, I can't run as fast as I used to. Well, of course, there's no doubt that the many services carried out by local councils contribute to the well-being of a neighbourhood. And in any road of well-kept property, there's almost one home that stands out and gains constant admiration. I say, Rodney. Yes, Charles. <laughs> just look at this house. Isn't it a picture? Oh, it's enchanting. Don't you just adore the subtle suggestion of neo-Gothic blended with pseudo-Tudor? It's absolutely dumb. How about that exquisite wrought iron work? Personally, I think that's overdone. You mean it's overwrought? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I say you are a wag. That's just that I could be very happy in a place like that, Ron. Mm. What do you suppose they gave for it? Oh, about ten or eleven thousand, I think. And worth every penny of it. Mm. Well, we'd better not stand here too long admiring the house. No, I suppose we'd better go in and collect the dustbins. <laughs> Madam, is your back <laughs> She's left the 
Let us now consider another essential service to the community. I wonder how many ratepayers ever stop to think of the vital contribution to public health made by the sewer men. To find out something of the conditions they face, we sent Cecil Snaith <laughs> down one of London's main sewers. Well, listeners, this is Harry Lyon. <laughs> 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 I'm speaking to you from a sewer pipe underneath one of London's busiest main roads. Above, I can hear the rumble of traffic, which adds a curious effect to the already eerie atmosphere of this dark, cavernous underworld. The feeling that one experiences down here is, is that of loneliness. Although London is high above, one does... Re what was that? Funny, I could have sworn I heard a noise. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying... <laughs> and this is Cecil Snaith from the Thames Estuary, <laughs> returning home to the studio. <laughs> Finally, we come to one of the more pleasant aspects of life in the community, that of social welfare. For in any district, one will find various organizations and clubs that fulfill the needs of those in search of companionship. Uh, it's crowded again tonight, Felicity. Yes, Ambrose, yes, I've never seen it. Oh! 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 What is it, you old faggot? Oh! Ambrose, somebody pinched me. Uh, you wish they would. <laughs> Ambrose, please, I'm sure it was Mr Jenkins. Uh, Teach him a lesson. Uh, all right. Oi, Jenkins, uh, how dare you pinch my wife? Oh, I never touched her. He's lying. Go on. I'm sorry to interrupt on the new member. Oh, really? oh. oh, good evening. Welcome to the friendly society. <laughs> Well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be marriage. Is it the main cause of divorce? <laughs> so, until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. If a dentist called McTavish pulls your tooth out, do you become Scottish by extraction? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. Daddy, can I have an orange lolly, please? Oh, Andrew, I really can't be bothered to go out and get one now. You don't have to, Daddy. Listen. That was an excerpt from The Iceman Comet. <laughs> Another in our series, A Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Chiversley Jump Humpington, Detective Inspector Bird of the Flying Squad, <laughs> Lydia Pott, the music of the Fleet Street Morning and Evening Pipers, <laughs> Miss Amelia Cannon. Oh, I mean, she's a big shot. 
to continue. Chamomile Fig, Lord Herbert Featherston Hoare and his Smoky Mountain Boys, <laughs> and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Good evening, welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that is brilliantly produced, the show that has superb music and vocalists, the show that highlights the individual talents of a versatile cast, the show that oh, in my opinion... Oh, get on with it! <laughs> the show that next week will be without Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Well, now, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since we last met. On Monday, I received a phone call from an old friend of mine, Bill Peace, suggesting we should dine together. So on Monday, Peace came to my house, and on Tuesday, I went to Peace's. <laughs> Wednesday, I had a, another rather nasty experience in my local. I was quietly toying with the cherry in my oatmeal stout. <laughs> When a chap came up to me, grabbed me by the lapels and shouted, I know your sauce. I've a good mind to punch you right on your big nose. I don't like you at all, see? And for two pins, I'd break every bone in your body. Just then, his companion tapped me on the shoulder and said, Take no notice of Fred. He's a bit merry. <laughs> Thursday, I had a very interesting afternoon when I attended a local seance. We all sat around in a circle holding hands and hoping to get messages. I didn't get any messages, but I got two jolly good phone numbers. <laughs> On Friday, I decided to stay in and get down to a job I'd been putting off for months, clearing out an old trunk of mine. Here's your morning coffee, Mr. Horn. Oh, sir, are you still at it? Well, yes, Prudence. Isn't it amazing how much stuff accumulates over the years? Look what I've come across. A photo of me as a baby. Oh. Oh, there, oh. lying on the rug, you see. Oh, sir. Oh, good gracious. I never realised you'd been bald all your life. <laughs> no, 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 Prudence, that's the other... Oh, oh, never, never mind, no. Now, wait a minute, I've got something here that'll surprise you. There. What do you think of that? A lock of beautiful golden hair. Oh, sir, you're not going to tell me this was yours? Yes, it was, Prudence. Oh. My head was a mass of golden curls. Oh. In fact, I remember all the boys at school used to think I was a girl. That must have been awkward for you. Yes, but it had its advantages. All the girls used to think I was a girl as well. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, you must have looked sweet, sir. It's all very nostalgic. Look, here, here my old school things. Cricket cap, blazer, silver cups and trophies. Oh, sir! Did you win all those? Yes, I was pretty good at poker. Oh, <laughs> how it takes me back. Oh, oh, Mr. Horn. Oh, just look at that. Whatever's that doing among your school things? Oh, that's one of my proudest possessions, Prudence. Oh, but people don't keep mementos like that. You don't understand, Prudence. You see, I was the one who climbed up and put it on top of the spire. <laughs> Oh, dear, I bet you would have won. Well, not really. No, I was quite studious, actually. Here are some of my storybooks. Fotheringay of the Fifth Form, Black Patch, Scourge of the Seven Seas. Lovely. And, ah, here was my favourite. It's got a bit dirty. Lend me a duster. What a funny title. <laughs> oh, Prunes, really. Still, I suppose it's little remarks like that that make this show what it is. Corny. <laughs> Called, then. It's called Adventure Stories of the Northwest Frontier. Lovely. Now let's see, let's see. Yes, yes. I'll read this one. It all started at the British headquarters of the Bengal Lancers at Shaw. devil's going on in there? Sorry, General. Have you got hold of Major Forbes Phipps and Lieutenant Carfax yet? No, sir. They've got hold of me. Ah! <laughs> Send them in at once. Sir? It is, gentlemen. Now, I've sent for you. Good heavens, Carfax, what's the matter with you? You look whiter than white. 
What on earth is that you are holding in your hand? Four feathers, sir. I thought I told you to keep away from that fan dancer. <laughs> I'm begging your pardon, sir, but whoever gave those to Lieutenant Carfax is suggesting he's a coward. It's a beastly lie, sir, isn't it, Major? I mean, you know jolly well that I'm known to all the chaps in the wagement as Mad Carfax. Do you know, I always, th I always thought that was short for Madge. <laughs> Well, don't let it worry you, Carfax. You're going to get a chance to prove yourself. Both of you. Special mission, General? Yes, Major. There's a rumor that the Afridis might start a jihad in the Kinjan. And that means the Kyber Pass might be involved in a lash car. <laughs> Understand? Yes, sir. Then perhaps you'll be good enough to explain it to me. Well, sir. I, I, I gather the uh, Freedy Hill tribes are massing in the Kinjan Caves for an all-out attack. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, gentlemen, your mission is to get inside the Kindran Caves and there contact the beautiful woman who rules the Hill Tribes. As you know, her name is a byword. I wonder what the A stands for. <laughs> I mean, could it be Angela, perhaps? <laughs> Lieutenant, take these two needles. What for, sir? You knit. <laughs> Her name is Yasmin, but she's known throughout India as Free Neasy. <laughs> Free and easy? Well, apparently she is. <laughs> However, she's working for us. Now both of you will go to Delhi, and there you will contact her faithful servant, Gunga Riwa. Good luck to you both. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, oh, Panjahor. Uh, how much further to Delhi, Major? Oh, goodness knows. By Jove, this, this heat is getting me down. It's almost unbearable, sir. Let's turn it off, shall we? Uh, <laughs> spin it. Something tells me this mission is going to be pretty dangerous. I have, a, I have a good mind to wash my hands of the whole affair. Oh, Major, please. Not while the train is standing at the station. <laughs> Good heavens, look! A band of ruffians led by a white woman. It must be Yasmin. No, no, it isn't. By gad, sir, it's Pat Lancaster. So it is, but I was right about the band of ruffians. It's the Variety Orchestra. <laughs> Greetings, Sad. Salam. Kuchda nachin hai. What does that mean? Sing, Pat. <laughs> Somehow, somewhere, someone's got to be kissed. Jarl in Ice Pat, or perhaps I should say, Mazjum Kuran Taj Pokai. Oh, we're on our way again, Major Phipps. Oh, look, uh, Carfax, a, a bearded chap in a turban has just boarded the train. <laughs> He's coming into our compartment. Salam, sir. Salam, salam. Uh, be, uh, be careful, Major. You never know whether these chats are being sincere with all this friendly greeting business. You mean it might be a false salam? <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen. You are Major Ford of Chips, this one with all the pips. How do you know my name? I am Gunga Riva, humble servant to Yasmin. There has been a change of plan. We will not stop at Delhi, but continue on to Jamrud at the foot of the Khyber. And from there, I will lead you up the hill slopes to the Ginyan Caves. How much further is it, Gunga? Oh, it is not much further, Major. I can't understand it. There's a perfectly good footpath straight up to the caves, and yet you've brought us up by this route. 
Up the rock face and with all these treacherous ledges. Why? With the much prettier way round. <laughs> no, Thob, we will rest here for a while. I say, Kuran Khan, what is this Yasmin like? Oh, she is very beautiful. Very beautiful. <laughs> Have you not read the poem about her by the great philosopher and poet? Omar Khayyam. Yeah, I can't say I have. How does it go? There was a young woman of Delhi who was... All right, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we, better, we better not have the rest, I think. Well, no, gentlemen. From here on, it would be safer if you proceed in disguise. Here are some clothes and two turbans. You mean we're to be water carriers? Precisely. But look here, if I'm to uh, play the part of a water carrier properly, you'd better let me have a picture. Right here you are. This is one taken of me at the seaside. No, no. <laughs> I'm wearing a banana from the stash. It's lovely. No, not Isn't that like... sort at all. Oh, I... oh, never mind. All right. Come on, let's get going. <laughs> Well, here we are, the King John Caves. Follow me. You know, I don't like it, Carfax. They should have sent a detachment of gherkins with us. <laughs> but, sir, don't you mean gherkas? No, I was thinking of our overseas repeats, actually. <laughs> Good heavens, sir. Look at that woman doing an exotic dance. It must be Yasmin. By Jove, how exciting she... She dances with abandon. That's about all she has got on. <laughs> Come, gentlemen. Yasmin! Here are two more tribesmen come to join. Greetings. Salam. This is uh, Forbes, Phipps, and Carfax, madam. Take off your disguises. That's better. Now I have a plan to help the British regiments overthrow... Gentlemen, the... everyone stay where they are. Or they will feel the blade of my cookery. Kuram Khan, where did you learn to use a knife like that? From a cookery book. <laughs> <laughs> now, Yasmin, I have known your plan all along. What treachery is this? I take off my disguise and see. <gasps> so, it's you. Yes, it's me. So you would defy me. Yes, Yasmin, we have been ruled by you long enough. But now it is too late. It is 12 o'clock and the hill tribes are rising. Lazy devils. <laughs> Soon the whole army... All right, drop the knife. Gungariwa has a revolver. Well done. I am not Gungariwa. I take off my disguise and see... General. General. Yes, gentlemen. <laughs> Now, what about you, Yasmin? Uh, no, I don't think you'd better take any more off. <laughs> but, General, sir, what are we going to do about the tribes? Don't worry. I've seen to that. Listen, gentlemen, the Lancers. Gentlemen, let's put an end to the trouble on the Khyber Pass. The regiment will return to England immediately. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. And <laughs> Carfax, goodbye to you, old man. Bye, sir. Goodbye. Now, come here, Yasmin. Yes? You have served the British well, but your work is done. Now there'll be more time for play. What do you mean? Yasmin, you're, you're very beautiful. Come closer. No... No, I don't think I should. Oh, come on, why not? I have a surprise for you, Major. I, too, have been in disguise. See! Good heavens! Who are you? I'm Carruthers of the Khyber Rifles. <laughs> And so to the Kenneth Horne documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, 
Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. <laughs> and this week we present a close-up on Foo. And hope it goes down well. <laughs> well, first let us talk to that well-known gourmet, Stanley Birkinshaw. Now, sir, you're something of an expert on food, I believe. Uh, that is so, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, a connoisseur, you might say. Yes. And what, what, uh, what do you like? Oh, I like all sorts of succulent dishes. <laughs> such, uh, such delicacies as oysters, smoked salmon, asparagus tips. <laughs> uh, what was that one, sir? Asparagus tips. Oh, yes. <laughs> And uh, escargots, or as they're known in this country, snails. <laughs> Sometimes I'm satisfied with more simple dishes, such as sole and tartar sauce. <laughs> Russian salad or sausage and mash. Yes. And what about wine? Well, speaking for myself personally, I like a nice bar sack or so term, but I'm not really a connoisseur on drinks. Uh, that is my brother's province. Oh, oh, you have a brother? Oh, yes, I have indeed, yes. Uh, Septimus Birkinshaw. <laughs> and is he anything like you? Oh, yes, he is, yes. He's a spitting image. <laughs> Here's a lady. Uh, madam, do you have any preference? Yes, I have, you see. Well, um, when I'm at home alone in the evenings, the things I really yearn for most is a, a nice, spicy foreign dish. Such as? Razzana Brazzi. <laughs> Now, here's a delightful old gentleman. <laughs> good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Now, now... Just a uh, moment, if you yes. will. Do you know anything about uh, uh, the gastronomic art? Oh, yes. I did touch a bit once. You're very nasty. No, no, no. no. Oh, 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 I'm very nasty. Nasty. You're not quite with me, sir. I, 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 no. I meant uh, good eating. Yes, that's what caused it. Right here. Oh, no. I blew up. I fell down. <laughs> I Let's uh, look at it. I can just, just, I, just one moment, sir. I, Let's put it uh, different, differently, shall we? Do you think food is important? No, no, no. I don't. We could all do without it. I remember once I went without food for 28 days. 28 days? 28 <laughs> days I went without food. Well, well, why, well, why was that? I couldn't attract the waiter's attention. <laughs> Well, to a lot of people, a meal is just a rather routine affair, but for the Epicurean, there are great delights in finding not only the right food, but the right place to eat it. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> Where's he running into you here? Oh, I've been coming here for months, Rodney. It's the only place to go. It's rather quaint, isn't it? Absolutely dolly. I find there's something terribly convivial about the atmosphere. Well, that's it. It makes a refreshing change, not having some ghastly trio turning out selection from the end of the mountains. <laughs> so completely restful, mm. one can relax and comfort. <laughs> Indulge in discreet conversation and enjoy the first-class cuisine. Oh, it's pleasure, all right, but the menu doesn't seem to have much variety. Well, allow me to order Rodders. Now, look, I recommend this. Hmm, if you say so. <laughs> Mears? Yes, sir? Two tenpenny pieces of skate and six pennies of chips, please. <laughs> Lots of pennies. Now let us turn to the manufacture of food. I, I wonder how many of us realise the care and preparation that goes into the product we eventually buy in the shops. We sent Cecil Snaith to a famous chocolate confectionery and biscuit factory in the north. Listeners, uh, <clears throat> this is Cecil Snaith speaking to you from the observation platform, which has been specially built so that any members of the public can freely inspect and survey the whole process of manufacture here. One gets a commanding view of the whole vast and complicated machinery that produces and packs the various products. Great cauldrons of deliciously creamy milk chocolate are being supervised by workers, ready to feed the machine which coats the toffees and biscuits. <laughs> yum, 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 yum. <laughs> <laughs> As 
they speed on their way down the conveyor belt. The first and foremost impression one gets is that of hygiene. This factory is a perfect picture of gleaming white spotless walls and everywhere one walks the beautifully shining and highly polished floors make it a very... And this is Cecil Snaith, the chocolate-coloured commentator, <laughs> returning you to the studio. Finally, let us consider that traditional British heritage afternoon tea. The tinkle of teacups at four o'clock in any home presents a picture of gentility. But for those who prefer to venture out for tea, it can be something of a hazardous undertaking. Oh, and get out of it. Keep away from the jam. Oh, I think I'm entitled to a little jam on my bread, I darling. wasn't talking to you, you silly old faggot. <laughs> you little wasp hovering around the jam. Go oh. on, get out of it. Here, yeah, have mm. another cucumber sandwich. Thank you. Oh, 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 what is it? Ants, ants, all over. Oh, I'm not taking another bite of anything. Oh, no. I don't know why we couldn't have stayed in and had our tea in peace. Yeah. We've had to contend with flies and wasps and goodness knows. No. Oh, 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 Never again. No, darling, Never again. Ooh. Come on, dear. Ooh. Let's go home. Yes. <laughs> yes, home, yeah. dear. Uh, I'll, home. I'll tell you something else. Yes? We'll never set foot inside this restaurant again. <laughs> There you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be perfume manufacturers. Do they ever get sent on holiday? <laughs> also, next week's program, we shall be having Miss Sophia Loren to sing us the jewel song from Faust. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new film which deals with life inside a Chinese cotton mill and called Loom at the Top. <laughs> So until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Is a 24-hour plumber always on tap? Good night. <laughs>
good evening and welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that is recommended by doctors everywhere as a cure for insomnia. Well, now, let me tell you, as usual, some of the things that happened last week. On Monday, I had hoped to see Barking Creek, but somebody had oiled him. <laughs> so on Thursday, I, I had a wonderful lesson in psychology. I was dining at a rather expensive restaurant when a couple arrived at the next table. She sat down and said something about being starving, but when the chap picked up the menu, I could see he was a bit startled at the price of the food. So he turned to his female companion and said, Well... What would you like, my beautiful little plump girl? <laughs> yes, I must remember that. However, on Friday, well, I was throwing a little cocktail party for the Kensington and St Pancras Poetry Lovers Circle. And I needed some of those little sticks that you stick in stuffed olives. So I popped into my local department store, Harridge's. <laughs> Lift, please. Going up. First floor, lingerie, underwear, boy scouts outfits, umbrella stands, salted peanuts, gramophone needles, and a nasty little floor manager named Hopkins. Um, excuse me, miss. I, I wonder if you could tell me where I might find those little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. I'm sorry, sir. I haven't the faintest idea. But you know what they sell on every floor, don't you? Not a clue. Well, what's that you call out every time we stop? Oh, is that? Oh, I just make it up as we go along. <laughs> oh, yes, it's much more fun than saying the same thing day after day. Second floor, bathing caps, sideboards, electric kettles, ping-pong bats, left-handed screwdrivers, haggis, extension ladders for nylons, hooks and eyes, anything you care to try. Well, I think I... Oh, look, there's an information desk. I'll ask there. Uh, uh, excuse me. Oh, good morning, sir. <laughs> Harry's information. If there's any little thing you don't see in the store... Yes? ...then you can safely assume we haven't got it. <laughs> but just refer it to us and we'll go out of our way to tell you... Yes? ...how to do without it. <laughs> Yes, well, I happen to be looking for those little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. Oh, yes. And um, where'd you lose them? I didn't lose them. I'm looking for them. Oh, I see. You arranged to meet them here. No, I'm not meeting anyone. Stood you up, has she? Oh, <laughs> girls are a funny lot these days. Trouble is, they're so hard to... Please! You took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, a fine information service this is. Well, thank you. We don't often get compliments. <laughs> nice, you are now nice. then, just, just wait a minute. I think I've got this. Excuse me. Yes? Do you have any self-globulating thermodynamic left-handed fish hooks? No. But we've got loads of little sticks you stick into stuffed olives. Thank you. You'll find them over there. There we are, sir. Nicely wrapped up. At last. And you're very, very lucky to get them. Oh, I certainly am. They were the last pair of Wellington boots in the place. <laughs> Wellington boots? I don't want Wellington boots. Oh, come, sir. This is England. Everybody wants Wellington boots. But I want those little olives you stick in stuffed sticks. I mean, I mean those little stuffed... Uh, uh, I want the complaints department. Over there, sir. Thank you. Oh, dear. Is this the complaints department? That's right. Well, look, I've been sold a pair of Wellington boots by mistake. <laughs> you call that a complaint? <laughs> Listen to this. I've been working for this firm for two years. At the end of the first year, I'm promised a rise, but do I get it? No. No, I don't. They changed my lunch hour from 12 to 1 to 1 to 2, which means I can't see my girlfriend because her lunch is still from 12 to 1. The food in the canteen's getting worse. I only get one week's holiday and my feet are poorly. Now, you think you've got a complaint? <laughs> I'm sorry I mentioned it. Goodbye. I say, uh, just a moment, sir. What have you got in that parcel? A pair of Wellington boots. Did you buy them? No, I didn't. I got them by mistake. I came here this just morning... Just as I thought, sir. I'm the store detective and I've been watching you. Look, you, you, you don't understand. They're, they're supposed to be little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. <laughs> well, I've heard some stories in my... No, time. no, no, wait, wait. Uh, I can explain everything. I came in to buy some of those little stuffs you stick in stitched olives... Uh, those little olives you stuff into... Those stuffed sticks... Uh, help, help! All right. 
right, sir. Come along. Thank Just you. Just a minute. I can vouch for this gentleman. Thank heavens. It's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> All right, sir, come along, please. Pad, please tell this gentleman who I am. Of course. This is Kenneth Hall. What? The chap who does that programme beyond our Ken every week? Yes, that's right. All right, sir, come along, please. No, Thank no, 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 no. <laughs> this is Pat Lancaster. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's different. Uh, just a minute. How do I know it really is Miss Lancaster? Well, she can prove it. Sing, Pat. <laughs> Jolly nice, Pat. Okay now, Mr. Store Detective. Oh, yes, that's Miss Lancaster, all right. Good. Well, now, does that make things different? It certainly does. All right, Miss, come along with me, will you? Uh, bye, Pat. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> My goodness, look at the time. I've got a party to organise. Taxi! Taxi! Oh, you won't get one in this department, sir. Oh. Oh, dear, I must get home in a hurry. Uh, I'll leave it to Harridge's. Mr. Fenelon, forward, please. <laughs> Say, uh, Horn, yeah. wheel the Kensington and St Pancras pair to love a circle. Appreciate your gesture in letting us get together in your bed. Well, thank you. Then perhaps you'd be good enough not to flick ash all over the carpet. Sorry. And hey, you over there. That's my best lamp standard. Please don't knock your pipe out on it. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll do it here. Is that better? That happens to be my hand. Oh, sorry. I thought it was one of those modern ashtrays. Oh, <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Horn. <laughs> Mr. Horn, have you met Chancery Willowweed? Uh, how do you do? Have an egg sandwich. Oh, divine. <laughs> Hail to the blind spirit, bird thou never worked. <laughs> <laughs> Shelley? Yes, this egg sandwich is full of it. <laughs> I say, a horn. Yes? These stuffed olives are delicious. And what a quaint idea, sticking matchsticks in them. Yes, well, I, I, uh, I had a bit of difficulty getting the proper sticks. Oh, did you go to Harridge's? Yes, don't tell me you managed to get some there. No, but I'm terribly pleased with my Wellington boots. <laughs> about our little band of members. Uh, please do, yes. Each of them in the circle is named after a famous poet. Chancery here is our Wordsworth. Yeah. And I'm Keats. And I'm Byron. <laughs> and who is that tall chap over there? Longfellow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought it might be. And uh, you see one in the corner spinning a cowboy rope. Don't tell me he's your poet lariat. <laughs> oh, you guessed. Well, everyone, what about giving our hairs to some of our recent offerings? Oh, yes. That's that's really really yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, let's start with Percy Calthrop. Percy. <laughs> I shall give you my latest. It's called the Calthrop's Elegy in Oxford Street. Last week I met a sales girl. In love with her did fall. And every time I kissed her, she cried, Will that be all? Well done. And so he should be. <laughs> oh, but I... Percy's work is known all over the West End. Yes, I've seen it chalked up on the walls. I think. <laughs> but now, uh, perhaps something a little more classical from our newest member, Thackeray. Uh, Splendid. Thank you. No, 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 no. Thank you. <clears throat> I must go down to the sea again. <laughs> well, thank goodness he's gone. <laughs> 
Never did like him anyway. Now, what about you, Chauncey? All right. How about two hundred and eighty pounds owed to my bank manager? Oh no, no, not that one, please. Uh, oh, very well. Peanuts. <laughs> I know a bar where peanuts are, and customers sit drinking. They serve them free from twelve till three, while everyone gets stinky. <laughs> I rarely drink. I sit and think, whilst everybody lingers. I am never tight, but late at night, I do have salty fingers. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Yeah. Horn, what did you think? What did I think? Well, I suppose it could be verse. Oh! Now, you must hear from Windersley. He's our great modernistic poet. Ah, yes, he is the Picasso of poetry. I hope you've got something new, Mendesley. I have indeed. I penned it last oh, night. Oh, how <laughs> sad. <laughs> now, I must have absolute quiet, yes, yes. please. Yes. Quiet. quiet for Windersley. <laughs> I say, what on earth's he doing? Shh, he's got to get in the mood. Yes, but not on my carpet. <laughs> <laughs> but he always strikes that pose before reciting. Quiet, please. <laughs> Splidge, splage, splodge. Three purple bananas on a windowsill. <laughs> A wondrous scene, they look serene and tranquil on the windowsill. Oh, that's jolly. I haven't oh. finished. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Go on. Please. Splidge. Splidge. Splodge. Thank God. <laughs> That was brilliant. Don't you think so, Mr. Horn? Well, I... Uh, when does this stuff always say something? Didn't it say anything to you? Well, yes, but I'd rather not repeat it, actually. <laughs> the trouble with you is you didn't understand it. I must confess I didn't. Of course not. You've probably never been pony trekking in the French Alps. <laughs> well, I... I haven't, but what's that got to do with it? <laughs> you see, the man just doesn't know. No, it's a Philistine. Oh, no, it's a Philistine. I doubt. I doubt if you could do anything like that. Well, I don't profess to be a highbrow poet. Well, you're not exactly a long hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still, I'll have a go. Now, uh, now let's think, shall we? Yeah, let's think. Uh, you're not going to write it on the spur of the moment. No, I'll write it on a little bit of paper, I think. <laughs> now, here we are. There we are. It's finished. <laughs> Incredible. Well, now, here it goes. Quiet, please. Darkling and dankling and low it sped, the sky o'ercast with stars. What fearsome thrill, how boots the night. What ho for berries and Edmonds. <laughs> that was positively spellbinding. What, uh, what will you call it? Well, I think I shall call it simply in search of those little sticks you stick into stuffed olives. Brilliant. <laughs> You're now entitled to join our little poet circle. Oh, well, thank you. By the way, everyone seems to have written poems except this charming lady. Oh, you mean Lorelei? Yes. Uh, madam, aren't you a poet? No, no, I'm not. But I'm a constant source of inspiration to all the other poets. As the painter has his true life model, so the poet needs his. Well, I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Well, you see... I am the young lady from Gloucester. <laughs> Well, so much for poetry. And now, breathe that a man with soul so dead, who never to himself had said, it's the Fraser Hayes Ford. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama.
Holmes. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on the city. Well, first of all, let's talk to those who work in this hub of commerce. Now, you, sir, I, I believe you're connected with the stock exchange. Uh, that is so, yes. Um, I am something of a speculator in stocks and shares. Are you considering some sort of investment? Well, I might be. What's the market like? Well, of course, there are severe fluctuations in stock market prices at present <laughs> due to a false inflationary spiral, but consoles and certain industrials are safe. Speaking for myself, I'm more or less satisfied with my preferentials, but I'm slightly concerned on another score. Oh, what's that? My debentures keep slipping. <laughs> Now, here's another gentleman. Are you a lucky investor? Yes, I certainly am. You know, two weeks ago, I had nothing. Today, I'm worth several thousands. Did you have expert advice? No, but I had complete confidence in my bankers. Well, may I ask who they were? Wolves, Manchester United and Blackburn Rovers. <laughs> now, here's a lady. Madam, I, I think you said you were a managing director's personal secretary. Yes. <laughs> That's right. How do you find your employer? Oh, he... he's most attentive. <laughs> Only yesterday he offered me a controlling interest in the firm. That's the fifth time I've refused. The fifth time? Yes. For a long time he's been trying to give me the business. <laughs> Well, I can't say I blame him either. <laughs> there goes a premium blonde. <laughs> now... Now we're privileged to meet a wonderful character. Good evening, sir. Yes, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Good night. No. <laughs> Just a moment, sir. Sorry. I'd like you, if you will, to tell yes. us about your job in the city. Yes, uh, sir. I, I am the stock keeper at the Royal Mint. At the Royal Mint? At the Royal Mint. Uh, how interesting. That's yes. where all our sixpences, shillings, florins and half-crowns are made. Yes, we're, we're simply coining money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're back again. Yes, good. <laughs> and how long have you been stockkeeper at the Mint? Forty-five years. Forty-five? Forty-five long years. Forty-five long years. Tell me, sir, uh, has any money ever been lost? Oh, yes. Yeah, all the time we are losing it. Hundreds of pounds every week. Good gracious. Yes. Why is that? The mint's got a hole in it. <laughs> well, let us now spare a thought for just two of the many millions who every day travel from near and far to their jobs in the city. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. I say, what a gorgeous carnation you're wearing this morning. Yes, it's rather dolly, isn't it? Well, we all need something to cheer us up. Did you read the financial press this morning? I certainly did. Do you really think we're heading for an economic crisis? Well, the government will have to impose some measures of restraint to protect our balance of payments. All right, you are, Charles. And quite frankly, Rodders, I'm getting terribly bored with the same routine. Yes, it's a pretty humdrum existence, but I trust we won't always be doing it. I should hope not. Personally, I'm sick to death of sweeping these roads every day. Lend us your broom. We had the shovel. Oh, oh I said the... <laughs> Those with an intimate knowledge of the city will be well acquainted with the old lady of Threadneedle Street, in other words, the Bank of England. And the expression, safe as the Bank of England, is certainly well justified when you consider its impenetrable vaults. We sent Cecil Snaith to report. Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from deep down beneath this ancient and historic building in what one might call the old-fashioned vaults. <laughs> well, I am standing in one of the huge safe rooms in which the vast sums of money are kept. And so foolproof is the system that once the enormous steel doors have closed, entrance or exit is impossible. Now, no doubt at this juncture, many listeners who know me well... <laughs> 
may suspect that I'm going to get myself locked in here for several days. <laughs> well, I can assure you that even though I seem to be rather accident prone, well, I'm not that much of a, to coin a phrase, right Charlie. So, let me just describe for you the interior of this task. <laughs> And this is Cecil Wright Charlie Snaith returning you to the studio. Let us remember that even the most routine city job is not without its hazards. Quite often an innocent bank cashier has been bound and gagged by bandits. So ladies, please be reasonable the next time your husband says, Sorry dear, I was tied up at the office. <laughs> Finally, I'll remind you that business hours for city men vary considerably, but we wouldn't be far wrong in guessing that the peak hour in most suburban homes is round about 8.25 any morning. Felicity, where's my stud? I don't know, Edward. Honestly, you can never find anything in this house. Edward, darling, come on, Rick. Oh, I haven't got time for breakfast, you old buffoon. Look at the time. Oh, you've got Look five at... minutes to oh. get to the station. Oh. Come on, my darling. Oh. Just have some toast. Oh, belt up and do up me cufflinks. Oh, dear. Oh. There, now, Ambrose. Oh, yes, rush, rush, rush. Oh. It's all your fault. Is... Why don't you get me off to work in time? Now, don't stop that, Ambrose, dear. Here's oh. your umbrella, briefcase, oh. and Bowler. Now, goodbye, my darling. I'll never make it goodbye, Felicity. Ambrose! You silly old faggot. I'm retired. <laughs> There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be... <laughs> Doctors' prescriptions, should chemists dispense with them? <laughs> also, next week's programme, which will be having the President of the Royal Academy to sing for us, You've Got to Have Art. Well-known critic Bernard Levin will be talking about the latest hit in the theatre <laughs> and telling us who hit him. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new film which deals with the work that goes on inside a baked bean factory and called Can Can. <laughs> so until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Does a blonde policewoman make a fair cop? Good night. You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jakes Brown. Good morning, sir, madam. Welcome to the kennels. Uh, how do you do? Oh, my wife and I would like to buy a dog. Oh, yes. What sort of dog? No, we don't mind, really. Well, of course, he must have a good pedigree. Madam, we only keep dogs of the eyes pedigree. I can assure you, if any of our little friends here could talk, they wouldn't speak to the likes of you. <laughs> good. Well, now, naturally, we don't want anything ferocious. Oh, no, no, no. A nice, friendly, good-tempered little chap. Oh, I think I know just the thing. In here... Never a dull moment with the doggies. <laughs> down over, down, down, down. Uh, uh. Oh, yes, they're always merry and bright. 
That was an excerpt from This Happy Breed. <laughs> Another in our series, A Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are the Lord's Taverners baseball team, <laughs> Tavistock Clump, Miss Cordelia Carpet. She takes a lot of beating. <laughs> to continue, Senor Don Jose Antonio Witherspoon, the Duchess of Didcot, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that goes out every week. And when it's on, so do the listeners. We asked a cross-section of people who'd heard the show last week. In fact, that's probably what made them cross. Uh, we asked them which part of Beyond Our Ken they liked best. Unanimously, they chose this part. You have either been listening to or have just missed thank Beyond... You, thank you very much. <laughs> well, now... Let me tell you what I've been doing since we last met. As a matter of fact, I went down to Brighton for a quiet weekend. At least it was the sort of weekend you want to keep quiet about. <laughs> anyway, it was very nice down there, and I popped into a little restaurant I know called The Harpsichord. They had all sorts of different food on the menu, so I asked for a clean one, but... Um... <laughs> I couldn't make up my mind, so I asked the proprietor. I said, now, look, I'm feeling in the mood for a really good meal. What do you suggest I should try? And he said, another restaurant. <laughs> However, I had to come back to town on Thursday because I had rather an unpleasant appointment to keep with the inspector of taxes. And so that afternoon, I went round to my local tax office. <laughs> Oh, uh, good afternoon. Mr. Figley is expecting me. Oh, yes, sir. Well, just take a seat while I finish with this other Thank gentleman. God. Now then, sir, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. Oh, but please, please be reasonable. We always try to be, sir, but the fact remains you owe us £25 in back tax and we must have the debt settled immediately. But I must have more time. I can't raise that sort of money just like that. Please, you've got to believe me. I'm sorry, sir, but there it is. Oh, dear. Where am I going to get that sort of money from? Where? Oh, poor chap. He has my sympathy. And mine, too, sir. We always feel sorry for the governor of the Bank of England. <laughs> yes, Mr Figley? You can send Mr Lord in now. Owen Simkins. Yes. Bring in the file, will you? I've broken one of my nails. <laughs> yes, very good, sir. You can go in now, Mr. Hall. Thank you. Ah, oh, Mr. Hall, do come in. Have a nice wooden chair. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. You know you've given me a lot of love. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like the show. The show? I'm talking about your claim for expenses. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, look, Mr. Mr. Pickley, oh. one thing you must remember about us people in the limelight, whether we like it or not, we have to put on a front. Yes, you put quite a bit on yours, haven't you? <laughs> no doubt it was this business lunch at your club coming to a total of £6.10. Oh, well, it, it was business. You had lunch with Phyllis, Miranda and Merle. Business, eh? You all get nothing out of that lunch. Well, it's funny, you know, that's what Phyllis, Miranda and Merle said. <laughs> Ooh, a right blowout that was, wasn't it? Ooh, I suppose you consider yourself something of a metronome. Gastronome. Don't you correct me. I was educated like what you was. <laughs> Don't you look, try look, it on. Look, Figley, Figley. Yes. Figley, it was hey? a perfectly... <laughs> it was Show a perfectly ordinary lunch. Yes. Was it necessary to have smoked salmon? Oh, sheer extravaganza. I mean, you could have had a bash at the old minestrone for half the price. All right, I admit it was foolish of me to lunch the girls. Mm. So you won't allow me the £6.10 then? Not the old amount, no. Well, then how about uh, £3.10 and Phyllis's phone number, Mayfair 5101? Mr. Horn, are you suggesting... I, if you are, let me tell you, never in the history... You did say 5101. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, thanks very much, yes. Right. Oh, and just one thing before you go. Just one thing. 
You know that little space on the form where it says, do not write anything here? Yes. Well, in future, don't put, and you. <laughs> no, miss, I'm afraid mink coats for appearances on radio are not allowable. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. Hello, Ken. Isn't it incredible the way we manage to run into each other every week just when it's time for my song? Yes, and here we are in the tax office. Right on schedule, eh? <laughs> now, come on, this uh, place depresses me. Let's go and have a cup of tea. Just a minute, Ken. I want to pop into this bookshop and get a copy of Fitzroy Prim's life story. Fitzroy Prim? Yes, don't tell me you've never heard of Fitzroy Prim. He was a contemporary of Oscar Wilde. You know, Pat, I, I've got a sneaking suspicion you're going to tell me all about him. Well, like Oscar Wilde, Fitzroy Prim was a flamboyant wit of those days, and his company was always sought after by the fashionable ladies of society. Almost any evening they would be invited to some soiree or other. Good evening. Is this where they're holding the soiree? No, sir. It's next door. Number 34. <laughs> oh, soiree. Wrong number. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Lady Windermere. Do I look like Lady Windermere? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, no. I am Fitzroy Prim. Come in, sir. Your hat. Thank you. Oh, I see you're wearing your hair in a fringe now. Yes, yes, I, I always prefer to attend a soiree with a fringe on top. <laughs> oh, oh, my dear Fitzroy, you look exhausted. Well, I'm all right. It's the jokes on soiree that are exhausted. <laughs> How enchanting you look, Lady Windermere, and such a beautiful dress. Where do you get your frills? In the back of a hansom cab, mostly. <laughs> We're all in the withdrawing room. <laughs> everyone, everyone, this is Fitzroy Prim. Ah, <laughs> oh, Fitzroy Prim, looking quite immaculate. May I say your suit is most frightfully uh, well cut? No, I've only had one brandy. <laughs> Permit me to introduce myself. I think I can safely say without doubt that I am the greatest living playwright. Oh, are you sure? Oh, no. That's that dreadful chap with whiskers and knickerbocker trousers. <laughs> I, sir, am Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Will. Oh, of course you must be wild. And so would you be if you were christened Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Will. <laughs> well, Prim, they were telling me about you at the club the other day. I gather you have a reputation of being something of a twit. <laughs> My dear Wild, you mean wit. I know what I mean. <laughs> Tell me, have you seen my latest play? Yes, Wilde. Now, uh, may I be frank? It would certainly be an improvement on Fitzroy. <laughs> uh, quite honestly, Wilde, I found it a trifle verbose. Naturally, it was intended to be a play on words. <laughs> oh, Wilde, what a veritable wet you are. You mean wit. <laughs> I know what I mean. Touche. <laughs> Gesundheit. Wilde. <laughs> Wilde, are you writing anything at the moment? Don't be absurd. I have a crumpet in one hand and Lady Windermere at the other. <laughs> oh, Oscar, Oscar, you are incorrigible. Oh, flatter. <laughs> Lady Windermere, would you get up, dear? You're crushing my carnation. Uh -huh. The famous wild carnation. Now, green, is it not? Yes. Which is more than I can say for Lady Windermere. Oh, do get up, dear. No, I can't, Oscar. My bustle is caught on your gold-topped cane. Yes, yes, I'd heard you two had become rather attached. <laughs> well, I will admit to being rather fond of Lady Windermere. Dear Oscar, he's one of my greatest fans. <laughs> Incidentally, who is this fellow laid out on the chaise long? <gasps> Gracious, I've forgotten all about him. He is a contemporary of Oscar Wilde. Not Billy Fury. <laughs> no, this is Lord Titus A. Newt. <laughs> oh, come on, Boozy, wake up. 
Oh, dear, I'll bust the doors off. Have, have, have I missed anything? Dear Boozy, he has the original copies of practically all my works. Really? Lord Newt, uh, have you got a, a woman of no importance? Yes, but Lady Newt is staying with the mother at the moment. Go back to sleep. <laughs> Go back to sleep, Titus. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Arnold Quill. His nibs. <laughs> Beastly theatre critic and fuel merchant. Fuel merchant? Yes, he's always slating my play. Ah, <laughs> oh, Larry Windleby, uh, forgive me for being late in coming here. My dear Quill, for being late, we forgive you for coming here. Never. <laughs> well, why is it that every time you open your mouth, you have to say something? <laughs> now, your epigrams will be the death of me. That is my sincere wish. <laughs> what about a glass of wine, Lady Windermere? Well, of course, Arnold. Now, let's see what we have. Just um... look how Quill is dressed. Shabby? <laughs> Downright scruffy, if you ask me. <laughs> Unfortunately, Wilde, I was unable to wear my best suit. Hop? Yes, but it'll be out at the end of the week. <laughs> no, no, I mean, what are you going to drink? Oh, sorry, Barsack. While that last play of yours... Yes? I trust it was. Fitzroy. <laughs> Fitzroy. Yes, yes. Now, this is where dear Oscar crushes him with one of his devastating witticisms. Just listen. My dear Quill. Yes, Wilde? Built up! <laughs> You're a stupid, vain, pompous, fat, conceited old windbag. I am not old. <laughs> Neither am I conceited. It's just that I happen to admire genius. Well, your plays have a certain anaesthetic quality. You mean aesthetic? I know what I mean. <laughs> trouble with your plays is they're not challenging enough. Why don't you give us something more intriguing? Ah, you wait until you see my next one. I have done just that. It is an exciting story of a rebellious man who recalls his turbulent life in the village of Ongar in the county of Essex. What's it called, Wilde? Look back in Ongar. Oh. Ah! <laughs> And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close up on entertainment. Is it better than television? <laughs> Now, Mr. Birkinshaw, do you agree with that? Certainly not. Speaking for myself personally, I find television most refreshing. Yes. What do you prefer to watch? Oh, all sorts of shows, westerns, musicals, quiz shows, plays, sport, the news, even the weather forecasts. <laughs> and what is your most recent favourite? Oh, well, I can't, I can't say, really. You see, I, I haven't uh, seen any television for some weeks now. Why is that? Something wrong with my set. <laughs> yes, so we hear. Uh, well, now, um, here's a lady. Madam, what form of entertainment do you enjoy? Well, you see, it's like this. So, you know, it's almost anything, really, except the ballet. Oh, you don't like ballet? No, I think it's ridiculous. All those people prancing about the stage, up on the tips of their toes. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, why don't they get taller people in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd never thought of that. <laughs> now let's meet someone who provides entertainment, sir. I believe you're a, a musician. Oh, uh, yeah, man, like, I mean, yeah, man, uh, yeah, yeah, you dig me? Uh, well, uh, I, I gather you like music. Oh, crazy, man, crazy, like, it's cool, like, I mean, real cool, cool, daddy-o. Yes, and, and, and who do you play with? The BBC Symphony Orchestra, real cool, <laughs> real cool. And I'm sure they dig you, whatever that means. And now, here's a delightful old gentleman. Good evening, sir. Good evening to you. Good evening, Good sir. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you very much. Indeed. Now, sir. I'm now. <laughs> If I could just... 
Just have a quick word with you. What is your favourite kind of entertainment? We're broadcasting on the wireless. <laughs> uh, ain't we? Yes, we are. Well, I don't think I'd better tell you. <laughs> No, sir. No, I, I don't think you quite understand. I mean, do you like the theatre or films? Oh, 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 I see, yes. Oh, no, well, sir, I like going to the cinema myself. I'm a very keen picture-goer. And how long have you been going to the cinema? Thirty-five <laughs> years. How long? Thirty-five years. Well, now, tell me, what has given you the most pleasure? Oh, the other night, sir, I went to the Ododrome. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw the most exciting love scene I've ever witnessed. A wild abandon wasn't in it. Oh, you should have seen those two. Really? Well, what was the film? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't watching the film. <laughs> One of the forms of entertainment which has a fairly wide appeal is music, although tastes vary considerably. For those who prefer opera, there's nowhere quite like that mecca of good music, Covent Garden. Hello, Ronnie. Hello, Charles. I say, look, they're doing Cavalleria Rusticana tonight. Oh, absolutely, Ronnie. Do you think we'll be able to get seats? Well, you know how difficult it is sometimes. Wasn't that the other day? I think it was last Tuesday. Oh, yes, Faust. Well, I had the devil's own job to get into there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Ronnie, kid. Sometimes it's impossible. I remember last winter queuing for hours out here in the cold to see La Boheme, and believe me, my tiny hand was frozen. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are a wag. <laughs> Doing that. Mind you, I'd wait all night for Aida. Oh, yes, I agree, Rodikins. Aida, as sweet as apples, Aida. <laughs> you are coming out with them today. <laughs> oh, well, are we going to see Kevin and Yoros Oh, rather, rather. Come on, let's go in and book our seats. All right. Oh, Charles, hang on. Haven't you forgotten something? What? What? What is it? Well, just look at you. Well, what's the matter? You idiot. You'll never get through the door with all those fruit baskets on your hair. Well, you take it up. You have done Now let us consider a much broader aspect of entertainment, the circus. Yes, the big top has fun and thrills for young and old alike. We sent our own commentator, Cecil Snaith, to investigate. Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from a famous circus ground where preparations and rehearsals are in progress for the big show. I've spoken to quite a few of the well-known circus people, Maldini, the trapeze artist. I had a little word with the animal trainer who's been telling me something of his life with the lions. <laughs> <clears throat> However, standing by me now is an act that has always intrigued and fascinated me, Marvo, the human cannonball and I have managed to persuade him to let me have a go at it. He has assured me that being shot out of a cannon is really quite simple. So, listeners, at last, Cecil Snaith is going to be fired. <laughs> well, I'm climbing into the cannon now, and Marvo is setting the charge. Ready, Snaith? Yes. Well, listeners, wish me luck. Right, here goes! This is Cecil Snaith, the first man on the moon, returning <laughs> you to the studio. And well done, Cecil Snaith. Mind you, the BBC will be rather annoyed. They'd promised that assignment to Richard Dimpleby. <laughs> Finally, let us turn to the field of light music. And we're very pleased indeed to welcome to the studio those popular duetists, Ambrose and Felicity Boo. Uh, uh, good, evening. Good, evening. good evening to you both. Well, now then, you've been you've been singing together for many years. What uh, duet have you chosen for us tonight? We'd love like to sing one of our favourites. Yes, it's a very lovely. Oh, shut up! I'll do the talking. Shut up! Oh, yes. be so rude, shut up! Darling. It's a very lovely ballad. Only a rose. Thank you. What do you yes. want to sing? Thank you. <laughs> Stupid old faggot. Please. All right, Mr. Pianist. Uh, uh, <clears throat> only a rose. Only a rose. To the 
To what do you attribute the popularity of your singing over the years? Well, we're, we're always, always in perfect, perfect harmony. <laughs> well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be ladies' hairdressers, do they curl up in bed? <laughs> So until next week then at the same time, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Could a large policeman on point duty be called the Colossus of Rhodes? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs>